You created my inmost being. You saw my unformed body and knit me in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You declared me righteous. You saw my sin, felt my shame, and reached down to restore my relationship with you. I am who you say I am. You have ordained my days. You have given me gifts and called me to community. I am part of your family. This family, your kingdom, has no walls and no borders. It is a kingdom of relationships. You've named this family the church. You knit us individually and you are weaving us communally. You are calling us to a life together. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We are your body, the church. 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 Sisi, ni mwili wako wakanisa. Somos tu cuerpo, la iglesia. We are your body, the church. Hey, good morning. Hey, this morning we are going to jump into Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. It is going to ask us to forgive as Christ forgave us. And so before we step into that message, I want to encourage us with communion. So servers, if you guys would come, we're going to start our message this morning with communion together. You see, forgiveness is one of those things that we all know we're supposed to do it. We all think about it. Uh, We all think people should forgive us. But the question is, is do we understand the source of the ability to forgive. And for some of you this morning, as we talk through forgiveness and talk about things, you're going to touch a space in your life that maybe you haven't touched in a while. Maybe you thought you could ignore it. Maybe you have thought that if I just don't think about it, it won't exist. But this morning's going to touch it, and you need the strength of the power of Jesus' death and resurrection to help you face it. And you need the strength to know that you are united as one. We are one body because of the work of Jesus. So let's stand together. Right here is our gluten station, gluten-free station. If you want to come to the, go to the right, come down and then circle back. Let's grab the elements together, receive them, and we will partake together here in just a moment. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, He shared a meal with his disciples. And he said, I'll I'll not share another meal with you like this until I return. But it was the tearing of bread to represent his body that would be bruised, beaten, and broken on our behalf. And the blood that would be shed for our remission of sins. So let's pray. Father, we hold these elements before you. And we declare the truth of them, that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we have been brought near to you. We experience your presence, your love, and your grace through the powerful work of Jesus' death and resurrection. And as we take these, as we partake of these elements together, you have made us into your church, your body in the earth. We acknowledge that. In Jesus' name, amen. This is his body that was broken for us. Let's take and eat. This is his blood that was shed for us. Let's take and drink. You may be seated. Christianity is about forgiveness. Brian Zahn says it this way, Christianity presents forgiveness as the restoration of the troubled relationship between God and humanity. Forgiveness is also that which alone has the capacity to achieve peace and reconciliation within human relationships, whether personal or global. If you're listening this morning or you're here in this room, And you say, Michael, 
I don't really get communion. I probably wouldn't even say I'm a follower of Jesus. Perhaps you're just joining us and, and you're like, I probably need to forgive, but I don't really know what that means. Let me just speak to you for a minute. First, welcome. I'm really glad you're here. I'm glad you're here in this room or you're tuning in to us. We're grateful that you would have this moment. And I'm sorry that there's probably things in your life that have happened that have hurt you, which is why forgiveness is a tough word to even hear. Second, let me just say the journey of forgiveness is available to you. I'm going to share some resources, and I pray that those help you today. But ultimately, I believe Jesus wants to help you. And so I invite you to consider letting him join your journey. And third, I pray that you would experience the presence of Jesus, the presence of God, the one who loves you deeply and who has provided a way for you to experience him and to know him. So let me introduce you to a lady named Sarah Montana. Uh, when she was 22 years old, um, she was the victim of a brutal crime against her family. A friend of her brother's broke into the house to steal some things to sell and realized that the brother was actually in the house and panicked and, sh and shot him. Then he left and ran away but forgot his coat and he ran back to get his coat so that there wouldn't be any evidence. And when he got there, the mother, uh, Sarah's mother, was there over the dead body of her son. And she was screaming. And because this guy recognized her and she recognized him and she wouldn't stop screaming, he shot her too. So at 22, she's now got no mother and her brother has been murdered. Um, and she is affected. And so the story of Sarah picks up seven years later, and she came to some place of understanding that she was so deeply tied to this now 24-year-old man who was serving two life sentences that her life was beginning to unravel. The murder of her brother and her mother was forever hooked to her, and she was losing herself in order to keep him in a, and, in a weird way, her mother and brother in her world. Here's a clip of her discussing what it felt like to discover that she needed to forgive and her initial journey into that. Rabbit hole until finally, my poor husband came home to a frantic wife, Farrell, just pacing the apartment, spewing statistics about forgiveness like, did you know that there are 62 passages in the Bible with the word forgive and 27 with the word forgiveness? Not a single one tells you how to do it. <laughs> They just say how great it is. It's like the Nike of spiritual gifts. Just do it. Oh. And then there's this Dr. Wayne guy over here who says, to forgive, we've just got to let go, be like water. What does that mean? My husband approached me very cautiously. Sweetie, what you doing? <laughs> Trying to forgive the kid who killed my family, but nobody will tell me how. Oh. There are endless five-star historical Yelp reviews for forgiveness. The sales pitch is fantastic, but literally, what do I do? I think I was asking the wrong question, starting with how, when really what I needed to know was why. Why forgive? Why do it? So we all start with how do I forgive, but not many of us ask why. And when we do ask why, sometimes the how is right in front of it. And so what we end up doing is we actually shortchange ourselves and we forgive too fast. And so if you want to consider to forgive as Christ forgave us, it takes time. And when you rush it, you might do forgiveness for these reasons, because it makes you feel like a good person. When you've been hurt and harmed, there is shame in your life and you feel bad. And you think, if I forgive, I will be good because to forgive is good. You may feel the pressure from people all around you, especially if you're in a church, to forgive because everybody doesn't know what to do with your pain. They don't know how to fix you. They don't know how to help you. And it would really make them more uncomfortable if you would just forgive so that they can move on. Sarah says, that's a pretty crappy reason to forgive. Or you want to shortcut the anger and the hurt and the messy healing stuff and just skip to 
I was hurt and now I forgave and I'm fine. And not think that your life has been changed or altered. But you see, these kinds of pains in our life, the kinds of pains that are like a mother or a brother being killed, they create wounds deep in us and they change us. And there is this process that God has provided for us called forgiveness, but it is difficult. Why is it so difficult? It is so difficult because as Sarah shares in this talk about her mother and brother's murderer somehow had become linked to her in a way like putting hooks in her back and no matter what she did, she always carried all three of them together and they were tethered to her. Now, just to help us get an illustration of that and you're thinking about like, no, this happened to me a long time ago, Michael. This, this, is, this is not really a thing for me right now. It's, it's more like this. It's, it's like somebody put a hook around you. Like I saw on the trail the other day, I saw yesterday I was running and there was a guy running along and he had one of those waist belts and a dog, you know, kind of hanging off of that. He's walking or running with his dog and uh, I'm running towards them and I watch because a squirrel goes across. <laughs> you know what's happening. And that dog went, Whoo! like, I'm all in, squirrel. The owner happened to see that as well, and he started barking orders at his dog to not do that. But that dog started going like this pretty fast. The deal is, is that most of our villains and monsters that have created pain in our lives, they're not obedient dogs. They just jerk us around whatever squirrel they find. And you find your life being tossed to and fro every time you hear their name, every time you hear about something that happened that touches your pain, you're connected to them, and you cannot be released. And you see, the why of forgiveness is about the hooks. The why of forgiveness, like Desmond Tutu shares in his book, The Book of Forgiving, he says, you are locked into your pain and locked out of your healing and your freedom and you finding peace. You become tethered to the person who harmed you. You forgive for your sake. Most of us think that our forgiveness is about letting somebody else off the hook. Forgiveness is not about letting somebody off the hook who hurt you. Forgiveness is about you being freed from the one who harmed you. Studies about forgiveness are linking forgiveness to reducing depression, increasing hopefulness, decreasing anger, improving spiritual connection, and emotional self-confidence. But in a like way, unforgiveness increases the risk of anxiety, depression, insomnia, as well as increased chance to suffer with high blood pressure, ulcers, migraines, heart attacks, and even cancer. You see, the journey of forgiveness is about taking the wounds that you have received in life and them becoming the scars of the battlefield. Have you ever heard of the word bleeding out? If you're in the military and you get shot, there's a chance that you die because not because you were killed immediately, but because you bleed out. You can't get help. Some of you are holding on to unforgiveness in ways that are causing you to bleed out spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. It is a gaping wound that has never been healed, and it is just open, and it's leaking out, and the pain is affecting every aspect of your life, and you're saying, but if I, if I forgive, if I forgive, then what about them? Don't they deserve the question is, do you understand you deserve to be free and you can find healing, but healing comes in forgiveness. Now, I want to make sure that we understand what I'm not saying. I am not saying that you need to forgive your abuser and continually subject yourself to abuse, violence, or emotional demoralization and verbal degradation of your person. If that is happening to you, that is not right, and it should not be happening, and it's wrong. Abuse of any nature, verbal, emotional, sexual, is wrong, 
Forgiveness might not even be an immediate topic for you if you're currently stuck in a situation where you're experiencing that. And if you are, we want to help you get out of that situation. So this week, today, let one of us know so we can begin to help you. It is about you being safe. It is about you being protected. Forgiveness has nothing to do with you going back and getting abused more and more and more. It is not okay to be abused. It is not okay to be injured. It is not okay to be violated. And it is not okay to be betrayed. So, Beth launched just a couple weeks ago into the second half of Ephesians, starting in chapter 4, and she talked about living loved, and that we can trust that what is true about Jesus is true about us. And then Scott last week took us through the passages that talked about we have, we have changed teams. We have a new uniform. We have a new playbook. Our life is different. We have been transformed. Now, those two stand on chapters 1, 2, and 3, which is eight weeks that we did way back before Easter. And so you cannot launch into 4 without understanding that you stand on the foundation of what God has done in Jesus and blessed us and given us identity as sons and daughters of God. Fully righteous, fully filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit, the guarantee that what he has promised to us will come true. So here we are, Paul takes us now to this verse in in chapter 4, verse 30, and he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now if you're reading chapter 4, and you're, you're, you're reading through, and there's all these things that I'm supposed to be doing, empowered by God, trusting in my new identity, and the ways that I interact, I'm going to put off this thing, and I'm going to put on this thing. And then all of a sudden, Paul interrupts, just interrupts the flow, and he just throws this verse in here about the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And so I'm asking the question this week as I'm studying, I'm like, why? Why did Paul do that? Why did Paul... Stop with what he was doing and then just say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And then, and then he just throws in, oh yeah, and get rid of all that bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and uh, be kind to one another and forgive one another as Christ forgave you. And so here's what I discovered. Is the things before this hinge verse is how you treat others. Filled by the Holy Spirit, empowered by God, standing in your identity, this is how we're called to treat each other. And the things that come right after this verse on grieving the Holy Spirit are how we respond to those who treat us poorly. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, standing on our identity in Jesus. You see, when it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit, it is a personal thing. The Holy Spirit is not the force of Star Wars, and I like Star Wars. But it's not some impersonal thing. It's actually a person who sets in your life. And you can grieve the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways that you grieve the Holy Spirit is to hang on to unforgiveness. You see, I can grieve, I can cause you to grieve, but I can't cause something out there to grieve. We cause people to grieve. And the Holy Spirit is so personal that when you hold on to something that grieves you, you actually can grieve the Holy Spirit. Eugene Peterson draws out that this is the only negative without a positive counterpart, partly because this is the only statement about our behavior towards God. All of the rest of chapter 4 was our behavior towards people. Don't do this. Put off this. Do this. And then all of a sudden, but don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this is the Holy Spirit that is referenced in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. It says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. 
This is the same Holy Spirit that was guaranteeing to us that this identity, the blessing of every spiritual blessing in our lives, this promise, this is the Holy Spirit that has sealed us. It's the same one. And then if you skip down to verse 32, let me read this the way it would be worded if you just read it straight out of the Greek. It says, be now to one another kind, tenderhearted, forgiving to each other, as also God in Christ forgave you, which takes us back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. This is why we started with communion. You cannot be asked to consider forgiving anything unless you are standing in the assurance of your own forgiveness. And then think about these words in verse 31, that middle verse that we're looking at today. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. Those are all the feelings and the words that come from someone who's been hurt and didn't forgive. These are the emotions of pain and woundedness. And so here we have, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And all these things that happen in your life because you've been wounded, I'm going to ask you to forgive, but you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. In Matthew chapter 6 is the Lord's Prayer in verse 9, and it reads like this. I thought about having us all say it together, but I realized that we all memorize it in different verses, versions, and so then it just gets weird. Um, somebody would go all King James on me, and I'll mess me up. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see, your unforgiveness, when you're not able to forgive the person who has trespassed against you, it is not that God withholds his forgiveness, it is that you cannot experience his forgiveness. Your forgiveness has been tied to Jesus on the cross. So it is not being held back from you. It is meaning that you cannot live in the freedom of forgiveness when you hold on to unforgiveness. Because unforgiveness begins to be this festering thing inside of you that is poison. You've probably heard the statement that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's harming you more than it's harming the other person. Now remember Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I spoke on that a few weeks back. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work within us. And we talk about that's not a building campaign verse. That's not the verse of health and wealth gospel. That's not a verse that says, if I can imagine it, God can do more than that. No, this is, this is the context right here. Chapter 4, verses 30, 31, and 32. You're going to have to imagine forgiving like you couldn't imagine. And so beyond the, the thing that you imagine forgiving, God says, I can do it. Because some of you in this room today, or if you're listening, you're actually thinking, I cannot imagine forgiving the abuse, the betrayal, the abandonment, the loss, and what you stole from me. As Christ forgave you. Only one thing I want to bring out here is that's past tense. We are to be forgiving one another in present tense because past tense, he has already forgiven us. We are free. The word forgiving for us and the word forgive or forgave for Christ is the same word. It is a wonderful word that deals with the idea of favor that cancels. I'll try to pronounce the word for you. Charizomai. 
It is favor that cancels. You see, it's not about Jesus dying on the cross so that he could just forgive your sin. It's so that he gave you so much favor and grace that your sins were canceled. Do you see the difference? It's not like Jesus died so that he could take just your punishment. No, Jesus' death on the cross frees the grace of God to flow to you, which is favor. And so favor flows and flows and flows, and in that your sins are forgiven. And when he says forgive, it is us issuing favor out of our lives towards one who has harmed us. Desmond Tutu, uh, who is a bishop in South Africa, he shares this story about, or this statement about unconditional forgiveness. He says, unconditional forgiveness is a different model of forgiveness than the gift with strings on it. This forgiveness as a grace, a free gift freely given. In this model, forgiveness frees the person who inflicted the harm from the weight of the victim's whim. What the victim may demand in order to grant forgiveness and the victim's threats of vengeance. But it also frees the one who forgives. The one who offers forgiveness as a grace is immediately untethered from the yoke that bound him or her to the person who caused the harm. You see, our forgiving is forever linked in the power of the cross. It is never something that God has asked us to do without Jesus. How many of you have ever thought, I need to forgive? And you think Jesus is watching on the sidelines to see if you can pull it off. Jesus isn't watching on the sidelines of your life to see if you can pull it off. He's in the middle of your pain. He's in the middle of that thing that you go, that's unimaginable that that happened to me. And you want me to forgive? And he says, yeah, because it is founded in the power of my blood and body that was given for you. You're not disconnected from me. So let's look at forgiveness and unforgiveness for a moment. Forgiveness reclaims your dignity and the dignity of the person who harmed you. Forgiveness reframes the event or the issue so that you can see humanity. You see, so often when somebody harms us or hurts us, they become the villain or the monster in our life because villains and monsters do terrible things. And so we take away their dignity and their humanity And we say, that's who we expect a monster to be. Forgiveness restores your dignity and theirs. It allows you to see them as human again. And forgiveness reconciles the people involved so that peace can come. Unforgiveness removes the dignity of a person who hurt you and ultimately removes your dignity because you are tied to them. If they become a monster, you become just a victim. So you are reduced to a victim defined by the shame in your life because you were hurt, and the one who caused the pain has to be a villain and a monster. And unforgiveness leads you to a place of retaliation and revenge that become your protection, robbing you of peace because now you live at war every day. A friend of a friend named Louise Sedgwick wrote a book called Lifted from Shame. And I was asked to read it last year. It'll be published this year. Hopefully it'll come out because when it does, uh, I hope it comes out in the fall so that I can buy a bunch of them and hand them out like hotcakes. Um, Because her story of trauma and the theology of God's grace and forgiveness touching her reality over the course of decades was undoing to me. It was layers upon layers of God reworking and reframing the pain and the subsequent shame that drove her life for many years into a story of redemption and freedom. But it was so real because it didn't happen overnight And it wasn't one of those that was just a fancy little thing that happened. And she said, oh, and I forgave and and I've been great since. 
It was like forgiveness work, and then all of a sudden it was like, wait, I thought I did that work. And she had to do more work. And it kept going, layer upon layer upon layer. But this is how the journey started, and this may be where some of you are at. She began to pray like this. I began to pray, God, help me to be willing to be willing to be willing to forgive my parents. Two willings were not enough. I wasn't willing, nor was I willing to be willing. I needed God's help to be willing to be willing to be willing to forgive. So please don't hear me say you're supposed to just forgive today. It is a process and it is a journey and you're invited to the journey. Why does the journey take so long? Wouldn't it be nice if it didn't take as long? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just get over things a little quicker? The problem is is that it takes a long time to heal. And forgiveness is the first step, and most of us skipped it and just started trying to heal. But we still are tied and tethered. And so we're stuck in unforgiveness, and we're saying, why can't we heal? Why can't we heal? And the Lord's saying, your very first step is to begin the process of forgiveness. And here's what happens while you're waiting. God is patient to heal you completely. He is patient to heal you completely. God is preparing you for the next step of the journey. And God is positioning others for your support. You are not to do this alone. You were wounded by people and you will be healed by people. That's how it works. Doesn't have to be the same people. But you got wounded by people and your healing comes because people stand with you as you walk through the process. It is a journey. There are all kinds of people that need forgiveness. Some people are the ones, the hurts in your life are so great and you can list them just as quickly as it would take to write them down. Some of you in this room are the reasons why people are hurt and you need forgiveness and you need to seek forgiveness. That's your journey. And then all of us at the end of the day need to come to terms with being able to forgive ourselves. It's a lot easier to forgive somebody else than it is to forgive myself. You see at night when you lay down and you go to sleep and you're sitting there and you're not quite asleep but you're not quite awake, you might still be thinking, how can God love me? Your journey has to start with forgiving yourself. So let me give us a tool before we close out today. Desmond Tutu in this book, The Book of Forgiving, He outlined some of the things they learned as they did the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa. After decades of apartheid and abuse and murder and rape and oppression, this country was ripe to come to a place of a bloodbath because apartheid had ended and now people wanted vengeance. Years, generations of people, hatred. Does it sound anything like what we might know? And what they did is they said, we have to tell the truth. And so they created a commission, and in community, they let people tell their story. And so it might sound like this. He had many wounds. She spoke with the precision of a coroner. In the upper abdomen, there were five. These wounds indicated that different weapons were used to stab him or a group of people to stab him. Mrs. Mawalui continued her harrowing testimony to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She spoke about the disappearance and murder of her husband. In the lower part, he also had wounds, total of 43. They poured acid on his face. They they chopped off his right hand just below the wrist, and I don't know what they did with that hand. And Desmond Tutu says, a wave of horror nauseated and nausea rose in me. Then it was the 19-year-old daughter who it was her turn to speak she was eight when her father died her brother was only three and she described the grief police harassment hardship in the years since her father's death and then she said this I would love to know who killed my father so would my brother and her next words are what stunned me and left me breathless we want to forgive them we want to forgive but we don't know who to forgive 
So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a way to step in the middle of an eye for an eye and just saying it doesn't matter what happened. Forgiveness is not about saying what happened to you didn't matter, it didn't hurt. What happened to you probably was wrong and it did hurt and it does matter and it's changed you. And forgiveness gives you a place to to begin the journey. And so Desmond Tutu gives us this fourfold path of forgiveness. It's fairly simple, but it is tell your story, name your hurt, grant forgiveness, and renew or release the relationship. Just four steps. Super simple, except not easy. You have to be specific when you tell your story. You have to tell the facts as they are. If you are the one who needs to forgive, you have to say, this is what happened to me. This is how I've been affected. And let that whole story be known. If you're the one who caused the pain, you need to own what you actually did. You need to say specifically what you did to harm. That's where you start the path. Then you name your hurt. You begin to say, I lost my mother, as Sarah would say. I lost my brother. They are no longer in my life. I won't have them at my wedding. My husband and my children will never know parts of me to make sense if they wouldn't have seen my brother and my mother. And you don't just name the things that, are, that have hurt you. You name all the ways that it has affected you. You name all the ways that now you walk in this life. If somebody broke into your house and stole from you, and now every time you go to sleep, you wonder if somebody will break in, that's an effect and you have to ask, Lord, can you help me forgive for that? Not that they broke in and stole stuff, but that I can never sleep again without wondering if it'll happen to me. That's a new way to walk in life. Perhaps it's somebody cheated on you and you'll never ever be able to trust again like you did before. There's always gonna be a hint of suspicion. And you're saying, "Ah, Lord, I, I will forgive for that. But you have to name it. It has to be specific to you. And then you grant forgiveness. Jesus's cross was sufficient for this sin as well. And you can grant forgiveness so that you can be released. Then you have an opportunity to renew or release the relationship. In the True Face uh, book, Healing Relationships, forgiveness carries the hope of renewed trust, but it offers no mandate or guarantee. You are not demanded to recreate a relationship with somebody that has hurt hurt you. It is a process of rebuilding trust. Forgiveness does not tell you that you now have to trust this person immensely. In fact, there's a little tool called a labyrinth of the fourfold path, and I just want to share it with us. It's actually more helpful because it it takes us through the journey the way it works. It doesn't actually work just to go through the four steps. The four steps actually are a meandering. So if we could show that really quick, the labyrinth. You basically begin to tell your story and you might name a hurt and then all of a sudden you're back telling your story because you're not ready to forgive the first hurt that you said. And so the way you use this labyrinth is you actually take your non-dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, use your left. If you're left-handed, use your right. And just work your way through the labyrinth thinking about your journey. This is a journey. And the labyrinth allows you to tell your story. It allows you to name your hurts, multiple ones, all the ways that you've been affected. It allows you to begin to grant forgiveness one hurt at a time. And then you get to decide whether you can renew or release the relationship. I don't recommend you just do this on your own, maybe with a small group of people that you trust. Walk through this. But this is just a small tool to help you on the journey. 
And as we think about closing out, I want to return to Sarah Montana. And after she'd worked through her journey, this is how she closes out her talk on forgiveness. Of all expectations, you can't expect a certain outcome. You can't expect them to reply. You can't even expect to know who you're going to be on the other side of it. Forgiveness is really tricky. It is one of those tools that is only properly wielded when we have healed just enough that we have nothing left to lose. If you're still hemorrhaging in pain, it is too soon to forgive. If you can't roll up your sleeve and show me your scars and tell me exactly what happened to you, it's still too soon to forgive. But it's never too late to let go of your villains and reclaim yourself. And if you're ready to let it all go, the grief, the pain, the anger, the trauma, and you're open to finding out who you are instead of always trying to prove yourself. I gotta be honest with you. All this forgiveness hype is legit. <laughs> 10 out of 10, five stars, would highly recommend. Thank you. Let's stand together. You see, Sarah got to a place where she says this. She says, one day I was losing myself in order to punish him, the murder of her, her mother and her brother. And I was trying to keep my mother and my brother alive, and it felt like too high a price to bear. And I was finally ready, ready to forgive and be free. This morning, for you, you may be in a space where you're just going to have to just start the journey and go, I think I might be willing to be willing to be willing to forgive. Or God, would you help me even consider to be willing to be willing to be willing to forgive?